So hi, my name is Phil Clark. I am a technology procurement consultant. I have been for a number of years and I am doing a quick video to help out Fairham College with regards to their T-level preparation uh, for the new uh, legislation that's coming through in September. Um, I'm in lockdown. Uh, my hair is a bit too long, so if it looks a bit silly with regards to the uh, uh, camera, I do apologise. Uh, fundamentally, what I'm going to do here is try and talk through some real world examples of how um, digital value to business is assessed and why it's important that people really get their head around that uh, as part of their education, etc. So I'm just going to cover off if my PC was working. Uh, a little bit about who I am, uh, by way of introduction and, and my career, really, just to sort of give you a bit of sense of um, what actually uh, I've been through in terms of getting through uh, my career. Um, why digital transformation is so important and talk about the importance of digital within organisations. So give some examples of where that actually has made a big difference um, and different use cases for, for what you can use it for. Uh, fundamentally, digital transformation is a massive thing. It's been massive for probably about 10 years, um, mainly because people have struggled to adopt digital mindset to the way they run their businesses uh, and you tend to find the ones who have adopted it successfully um, are the ones who do best and I'll come up with a few examples of how that goes as well and at the end uh, I've got a little task for you guys to uh, have a go at um, it's really uh, just to try and find a way of improving a process that's working at college at the moment so uh, bear that in mind as I go through the slides just to see if there's anything that resonates that you can think about uh, doing that as a, as a bit of task. So a little bit about me, uh, picture on the left there, I actually found my old NUS card, which is quite funny, National Union of Students. Um, I'm called Phil Clark. I'm 50, uh, 47 years old. I live in Lockheath, just up the road from the college, so not too bad. And I went to Fairham College uh, between 1988 and 1990, which were fantastic years, um, a really good time there. Um, as you can see, slightly longer hair, but I think give it another couple of weeks of lockdown, I will be uh, in a similar look, um, probably slightly more wrinkly. Um, when I left college, I left with three A-levels. So I did maths, physics and computer science. And at the time, there wasn't really much other choice at Fairham College. Um, basically, A-levels were the only thing you could do. So this T-levels initiative sounds very, very interesting. Uh, and I'm really happy to be working with, uh, with Debbie on trying to get this organised. Um, at the end of college, I joined uh, IBM. Uh, they were just up the road in Portsmouth. Um, on their sponsored student scheme, which was very, very lucky. So I managed to get myself to a position um, where I was being paid to go to university. Um, not many people do this these days. Um, I worked three days a week at IBM doing a, a, a proper job. Uh, and then two days a week, I went to University of Portsmouth doing computer science. Um, and so you know, my university days were awesome because I basically didn't incur any debt. Unfortunately, uh, uh, that's sort of changed a little bit in, in recent times. Um, but you know, it was a good scheme at the time. I think the one thing I've learned from that process, and I'll, I'll go on to talk about this, computer science is really broad topic, um, but also it depends on how you approach it. Uh, a lot of people focus on the technical aspects of computing and computer science, which uh, is valid, but I think the more uh, commercial or operational side of things needs some consideration as well, which is why I think this T-level initiative is a really good thing. Um, gives you the opportunity to think about how computers can be used rather than just how you can program computers or how they're built. So um, I, I would wholly recommend keeping a nice broad view of computing, um, not just diving into the coding aspects of it, because I think there's a, a massive application of, of IT uh, in industry that, that hopefully um, you guys will get the benefit of. Um, genuinely, I'm going to say my, my years at Fairham College were the best years of my life. I had so much fun. I think the world was a slightly different place 30 years ago, but fundamentally, you know, it set me up perfectly well. And from a career perspective, uh, you know, I've actually had a very successful, in my view, career. I left, uh, as I said, in 1990, I joined IBM or did the IBM course um, where I mainly did a technical job and, and that was coding and systems analysts. So, so I got into quite a lot of detail around the way IT was being used or being programmed in, in industry or specifically in IBM. Um, it was all right, uh, but not really my cup of tea. So I left uh, in 1994 to join a company called Anderson Consulting, which is now known as Accenture. And they're a big uh, consulting organization based out of London, uh, but they're actually, you know, they've got offices all over the world. Um, and I was, my, my role there was to help on some of their client engagements to design operational processes, to design the way IT is used um, within their clients. So I worked for the London Stock Exchange. 
I worked for Seaboard, which was a big um, energy company at the time. Uh, I went up to do some work in Newcastle with a government organisation. Um, and really, the skills I learned there were around IT, the IT, so ITIL, the IT infrastructure library, um, and really got my head around how services work around the technology. So moving away from coding and hands on the keyboard stuff and really thinking about how technology can be used to deliver a service to the business. And that set me up with some really good grounding um, to move into my next stage of the career. I actually went back to IBM in 2000, um, largely because I just had a baby, not me personally, obviously the wife, um, and got myself to a position where I wanted to be a bit more settled. So IBM offered that uh, and I did a piece of work there. But IBM offered me a slightly different view of the IT market, which was really more around the commercial aspects. So contracts and pricing and billing. How do you make money out of IT? And so IBM, uh, between 2000 and 2006, oh, you know, I, I did account management jobs, which is basically a job where you uh, are the face of IBM to a client of IBM's. Um, and I did some sales and, and proposition building, which I think has helped develop my skills to to work in things like digital transformation. So understand how IT is used in a client so you can talk about how to tweak things to make it a little bit more efficient. In 2006, I left to join a small company that no one would have ever heard of. In fact, they don't exist anymore. A company called New Solutions, uh, who were a very, very small company based in London. I spent eight years there. Working for small companies is awesome. I can wholly recommend once you've got a bit of a grounding in uh, some big name companies, you know, working for a smaller company where um, there was only actually about 50 people in the company when I joined. Uh, we grew it to about 250 people. So it, it was a success um, and you know, learned a lot about the way businesses operate. So I'd, I'd recommend that. And then in 2014, I'd start my own company called Embedded IT. And what I do now is I help clients uh, buy technology. So I will typically turn up to a client such as Verum College, and I will uh, help them understand where to buy their IT from, um, not just the computers and the laptops and bits and pieces, but also where they're using a support company to do uh, to keep their IT alive, or if they've got wireless access points, you know, who's maintaining those, and all of those are surrounded in contracts. So it's really all about trying to help um, businesses like Ferrum College, or I'm currently working for EDF Energy, or, or other companies like that, um, get ahead, get their head around what the contracts look like and how technology is serviced through those contracts to the, to the business. Anyway, um, part of that, I do a fair bit around understanding where digital transformation could work, hence my selection of digital transformation as a topic. So what is digital transformation? So there's lots and lots and lots of uh, definitions around this. Um, it's a massive industry buzzword and has been for a long time, as I previously said, that basically what it is is about finding aspects of a business that will benefit from some sort of digital technology. And digital technologies generally means things that are on a computer. So if you think of uh, simple things like scanning a piece of paper and putting it onto a computer, it's clearly a lot quicker to send an email with an attachment than it is to send a piece of paper through the post. And that is a pretty basic but good example of digital transformation. The other benefit of turning something into a digital uh, a piece of digital estate um, is that you can do things to it with a computer that you probably would need a person to do it if it was in physical form. So that would be if you scan in a, a form and um, you want someone to read that form, a computer generally could read that form digitally, uh, whereas if it was a physical piece of paper, um, you'd need someone to have a look at it, actually an individual, and, and check it all over. And so clearly, if you think of those as two really simple examples, they have masses of uh, applications across all businesses in any industry. Uh, and as technology has evolved over the last few years, we've got ourselves into a position now where technology can genuinely add value to most businesses or most digital areas. Um, and therefore, digital transformation is a massive, massive industry and will be for years to come. Different companies or different industries have uh, adopted digital transformation at, at different paces. Some are slowed down by the regulation they need to adhere to. So for instance, in banking, um, there is a requirement in some cases to store pieces of paper for 30 years. Um, and so you know, it's very, very difficult for 
companies to move away from paper and, and physical forms if they're legislated by a bunch of regulation that they can't avoid. But, f- but fundamentally, people who are not regulated or startups um, are in a position where they can generally transform themselves a lot quicker. And therefore, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting area. It's been around forever. You know, my first job in 1990 uh, was a, a digital transformation of uh, it was an email system. But you might find this difficult to believe. But in an office, there used to be a process by which someone would print a piece of paper, stick it in the in tray, and some little man with his trolley would turn up and pick it up and deliver it like the postman does. Um, we implemented email in IBM and that changed the whole company um, because information could be shared really quickly um, and therefore we were a lot more efficient. And it, that was probably a, you know, one of the earliest transformations, mass transformations that happened. Um, clearly with the internet that came about probably 15, 20 years ago, um, a lot more people could trade emails and uh, that became a lot more efficient. And then you know the whole thing started to snowball from there. Um, the other thing to bear in mind about digital transformation is it's not just technology. It is quite a big change. So if you think back to my example from the 1990s, persuading people to uh, move from putting things on a piece of paper and giving it to the mailman uh, to sending it via email was a bit uncomfortable because it's a change and people don't like changing things. Um, Clearly, the little guy who walks around with the internal mail probably was made redundant. Um, There are a number of people who used to type up people's memos. They soon went as well. So uh, as, as aggressive as that sounds, for a business to transform, it needs to not just think about the technology implications, but also the implications on the rest of the organisation. And in some cases, people might change jobs slightly. uh, But in all cases, the technology would mean that things are more efficient and quicker and generally a bit better. It's really, really important because Basically, businesses go out of business as a result of this sort of thing. Um, I've got an example in a moment, but fundamentally, if your competitor can do a better job at the thing that you do because they're using technology in a slightly more clever way, so it's either cheaper or it's quicker, then your customers will go and work with them. Um, And I can imagine in your own personal lives, uh, you all make those sort of decisions without even thinking about it. Um, You will buy a phone or use an app um, that is slicker or easier to use rather than uh, you know its competitor and therefore its competitor is probably struggling for business at the moment and it's those sorts of things that you need to think about all the time it's all about driving improvements by using technology appropriately belting example is netflix now i don't know if many of you will remember um, but when i was a kid back in that days um l- Watching a film was a bit of a task. You'd have to get in your car and drive to a shop called Blockbuster um, and you would get a video and you'd stick it in your video or a DVD, stick it in your DVD player um, and that was your Friday night sorted. Clearly, everything changed when the, the movie industry digitised their content. And that combined with the internet meant that Blockbuster, which was a, a household name across the world um, back in 2004, had to transform its whole business to support you know this whole new revolution of watching films over the internet um, by stark contrast netflix which wasn't even a thing or just had only just started had already spotted that this was coming and they decided to change their business model to stream media across the internet now i haven't mentioned anything to do with it yet this is all about business models but you can see where this is going Clearly, Blockbuster no longer a thing. Over the six-year period, they lost their whole business. Netflix, as you're probably all aware, is now a massive global conglomerate um, and is doing incredibly well. And it's because they were able to support or adapt to the digital transformation area a lot quicker than some of the bigger businesses Blockbuster. And you'll see this in industry quite a bit, where a business is established and has been for a number of years, um, a major technology change such as this can be their downfall. And there's examples such as um, Kodak and uh, digital printing or digital cameras. Um, There's all sorts of examples of where where brands have really struggled because they haven't adopted uh, technology appropriately. And transforming to a digital organization is something that will keep you ahead of your competitors and stave off some of these, uh, these startups that you can see here, such as Netflix. So digital processes are pretty broad. 
they uh, genuinely now can uh, be in any bit of the business. And I'm not sure what the course content for business organizational stuff that you're, you're doing, but fundamentally within a business, there's lots of different areas. So if you look at things like marketing, back in the day, people used to send out letters to your home address to ask you to buy their product. Now you can scrape the internet, uh, do data mining on people's individual Facebook profiles and target an individual at the point at which they want to buy something to, to actually say, well, here's my product, do you want to buy it? And therefore you get better conversion as a result of that digital transformation. Sales, obviously most things are now online. Clearly with it being online, um, it allows you to support a more, more global audience or a broader audience. And so your target market is bigger, but also you can, because you've got the data associated with it being digital, um, it's a lot easier to run reports to say this country is doing better than that country or those sorts of things. So you get a better uh, data view of, of, of the industry. Um, finance, the banking organizations have all been online for a while. Um, some people still send paper invoices, as mental as that sounds. So it takes three days for a, a request for payment to re reach someone. Not many people open their post these days, so it gets lost in the post a lot. Um, putting online payments into a business can fundamentally change the way they operate. They get their money quicker. Um, they can bill a lot more smoothly. It, it just makes a lot of change. So that's always a big area to focus on when you're looking for digital transformation projects. 3D printing, not quite as big as it could be. Um, but if you think of the way that that is working, basically a manufacturing process at the moment, you've normally got a big factory somewhere that is making something and it makes gazillions of widgets and those widgets get shipped by a lorry to a, a customer. And that's all very interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, if that process from requesting a product to it being made, to it being shipped, to it turning up takes a couple of weeks, 3D printers being in people's homes could fundamentally change that. And this is a big thing over the next 10 years, I think. As 3D printers, the price of 3D printers comes down. Instead of you sending the product, you digitally send the design of the product to a printer in someone's house, and they could print it and have it you know, within hours rather than weeks. So I think from a digital transformation perspective, 3D printing is a massive thing to watch. Be interesting to see how that goes. HR, contract signatures, you name it, anything in a business uh, can be improved with technology. Um, and as technology evolves and gets better, there will be more and more aspects of um, those technologies that, that you can adopt. Um, it's really important to repeat, though, it, it's not just about technology. And, and to do this, you really need to think about the business processes and the cultural implications of what you're doing. If you rock up to a business and say, I can digitally digitally transform you, by the way, that means you're going to lose your job. It clearly won't go very well. So you need to think before you uh, apply some of these technologies to make sure that the business is ready for whatever you're proposing to do. Some of the things that you might hear when you're looking at this, and there's a little bit of homework for those of you really interested in this, Robotic Process Automation, or RPA, is basically a method by which you can automate someone's work. Now, this has gone a little bit beyond just scanning forms. What this is, this is really, um, if, you, if, you, if you do a job that is really repetitive, that let's say you need to look up uh, a name and address, and it's on a browser, so you uh, go to a, uh, open up a browser, you Google... Fairham College address and it comes back on the screen with, with the address of Fairham College. Doing that once is okay. If you had a list of 10,000 colleges in the UK you wanted to do that for, that would be really dull and you'd probably make big mistakes. There are technologies such as UiPath, Automation Anywhere, there's a load of them out there, but UiPath is probably one of the market leaders. Um, it, it basically allows you to, it will copy what you've just done on the keyboard and it will work through a list of colleges in this instance, uh, Google it for you and return the results. And that means that you get you know, a, a consistent flow of um, returns instead of having to uh, do that manually. And so that repetitive work is, is done by a robot, robotic process automation. Um, and for those of you who are really interested in this, UiPath, I've had a little play with it. Um, you can download a free copy uh, called UiPath Studio. And if you've got a PC at home, it's a really good thing to have a little play with because that as an industry is something that if you understand it, there's quite a lot of opportunity for people to, to get into RPA there.
Clearly, artificial intelligence, machine learning is something that has been around for a while. As that gets better, that will make things a lot easier to automate from a digital transformation perspective um, because computers will be able to make decisions rather than just doing simple actions. Uh, for now, it's fairly limited in, uh, as of 2020, um, but I think going forward, that will improve very, very quickly. Um, it's all about data. So when you digitally transform, transform something, digitize something, it then becomes data on a, on a technology system um, and therefore you can manipulate it so data manipulation is key there are some project management terms that have been around for a while again um, historically uh, projects used to be run where you define your requirements build something implement it see how it worked and then go around that loop a number of times that's called the waterfall method um, these days because of the internet and people expecting things a lot quicker um, a new project management terminology has, has evolved, which is called Agile or Agile Planning, um, which is basically you have a group of people, all of whom can make decisions, and you build something and just bang it out there uh, and see what happens. Um, and whereas before a waterfall method would create really robust, perfectly tested systems very quickly, um, Agile allows you to try things and see if they fail, fail fast. And so instead of spending a few million quid on a project to uh, to build something and, and then it failing at that point, uh, you can find out within tens of thousands of pounds in, in some cases. So it, it's a it's a useful tool to understand how things can move quickly. And that's all been created as a result of the sort of data and digital transformation industry um, to allow you to trial new processes to see how they work. And the final thing, people in digital transformation world are, are very, very keen to see a roadmap. If you do if you digitally transform one aspect of a process, what do you do next? Just to try and make sure that you've got a, a strategy to support, rather than just picking off individual things, understand exactly how it's going to work long term. So where does this work? Well, you probably need to look on look for things that have got a really heavy reliance on things you can touch, physical things, paper, anything that requires a physical signature, physical review, um, anything that requires some aspect of uh, things that aren't on a computer. Um, and you, know, you can take any example of that, card payment systems. You know, I think the days of us using plastic cards to scan or contactless are going. You could probably move that onto, uh, um, onto your phone, as most people have done, uh, with, with Apple Pay. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you look at. And if you can look for things that re need a physical aspect or physical thing, um, then that is probably a good candidate for a digital transformation. Also, look for any processes that are really repeatable. There are people who still have a job where they take a piece of paper and they have got 20,000 pieces of paper they've got to do. They look at it, tick it, and move it to the next, next column. So anything that's boring or repetitive that you can use automation with um, that is supported by a physical thing, really, really good candidate for digital transformation. And the other final thing is look, just think about the rules. So, you know, if you can automate a process by a really simple set of rules, if, if on this screen, this piece of text is there and I need the piece of text next to it, that's a really good candidate for some sort of digital transformation process or on a form. Um, so it's really more about trying to find simple rules. If things get a bit more complicated, i.e. you see a physical piece of artwork and you need to form an opinion on whether it's really good or not, um, that's probably not a good uh, digital transformation uh, process opportunity because computers haven't really got the ability to judge something that way. Um, so your task, should you choose to accept it, is to think of a process in your day-to-day -day college life. Think of an aspect of your education that could be improved through digital transformation. So has anything in your daily world um, got a physical aspect to it that you could fix? So is there, um, in your journey to college, uh, is there anything where, where you go about getting to college, getting to registration or in the library? Um, those sorts of things. You can see an example here. Think of one of those and then try and work out what is the ultimate outcome of this process. So, so you know, picking on paying for your lunch, the ultimate outcome of that process is that the person who's selling you your food gets the money in their bank. So I'm guessing in some cases you pay with cash in other cases you probably pay with payment cards. Um, is there some means by which you could make that a bit more interesting, a bit more efficient? Um, and generally speaking, that would be making it quicker or making it cheaper. Is there any other aspects in your day-to-day um, uh, -day work that means you have to fill out a form? Again, the great opportunity for those sort of things. Once you've got defined what the outcome of that process is, design a set of process charts, blocks, 
that lists the process steps. So in this instance, um, uh, paying for your lunch, you would say, uh, go to till, take money out, give money to person working behind the till, they give you change and so on. So work through a process step as granular as you can, and then think about ways you can improve that with technology. So in this instance, go to till, don't give them any paper money, but actually replace it by scanning a contactless card. Actually, it's a bit of a bad example, but you can see where I'm going with this. It's really all about using technical aspects to improve a part of your, your data education. So that's all I was going to say. Um, I hope this has been a useful test case for Debbie. And uh, if you have any questions, please get in touch.